but uh, I do have my brother's graduation that weekend. So I will be a little MIA in case you have any questions. Um, okay. Alrighty. Other than that, any questions? Yeah. Um, so I think I don't, we, I don't know if we've decided if it's all multiple choice yet or not, but they've done that in the past where it's been all multiple choice. So then I want you to take your like middle ground multiple choice question. And that would be your exam questions. I think it would be more of a harder multiple choice on your exam than a quiz question. Yeah. Uh, it'll be in person. Yep. Anything else? It should have more information tomorrow or like Monday, I think for that one. Alrighty. What would we like to see today? Y'all feel really good? How are we feeling about rate laws and all of that stuff? A little over rate laws? Yeah. So what is a rate law? What does a rate law tell us? What does a rate tell us in terms of chemistry and reactions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, right? So it's how fast the reaction happens. And it's going to be, um, right, your change in concentrations. of reactants and of your products. Right, so if we can look at just a general reaction, we can have A going to B, right? And in this case, if we start off, what is going on? Right, so in this case, if we just start with A, right, we know that if we look at a graph, if we just start with A, then we have concentration on our y-axis, and this is time. B, right, we have none of B. We have no products at the beginning. We just have reactants. So over time, our products are going to produce, our products are going to get produced, and our reactants are going to get used up. So... We'll talk about equilibrium um, in like the last couple of days of class. Um, but right here, this is going to be your rate portion. Right, it's how quickly the reaction happens, um, how it changes, how that concentration changes over time. And then in this section here, this will actually become your equilibrium. Okay, but for rate laws and rates of reaction, we're looking at that first initial portion where we're changing our concentration over time. When we're looking at this reaction here, we have one A goes to one B. So if our reactant is decreasing by one half, how much is our um, product being produced by? I guess if we have a a constant change concentration, this is going to be a rate, let's say, of 0 0.05 molarity per second. What's going to be our rate for our product of production? Is it same, different? We don't know, we can't tell. Mm -hmm. It's the same. When we look at our coefficients in front of A and B, we know that for every one A that gets used up, we get one B that is produced. So if the rate is changing by 0 0.05 molarity per second, then the change in rate of B 
is going to be also 0 0.05 molarity per second. All right, and this comes into play because we have our funky change in concentration of A over time is equal to the change in concentration of B over your change in time. Where the change in concentration over change in time is that rate that we're looking at. And that concentration is final concentration minus initial concentration. If we had something or a case where for every 2A, we got only 1B, that means that our reactant is going to be used up twice as fast as our product is getting produced because we need 2As for every 1B that gets produced. So in your... In your rates here, we're going to take the reciprocal of that coefficient and put it in the denominator of our A. Because if A is getting used up twice as fast, then we need to reduce it by half in order to make the rate of B production equal to each other. Does this make sense? What's happening here? All right, you can plug in numbers. You can plug in actual values for these portions here. Those can be actual values. Yep. Um, that would numerically come out to be the same. But in terms of, like, I guess, convention, we always take the reciprocal of the coefficient. Because um, it's easier to, especially because if you have, right, if you have this kind of reaction here, it would be hard to compare what's happening across all the boards if you're just, if you, try to use the coefficient in the other one. So if you just take the reciprocal, then it's a little bit easier that way to explain it. All right, so in this case, A here is still gonna be negative change in concentration over change in time. B is going to be your change in concentration over change in time, but this time there's a three in front. For C, we're producing your, um, your product C here. And if it gets a four in the denominator. And then your concentration for D is going to change over time. And that gets a two in the denominator. So if you're just comparing two of them together, um, right, you can say that the negative change in concentration of A over T is equal to... Oops, is equal to the change in concentration of product C over four. Okay, so you can compare any one of those together. They all are now relative rates of reaction and they're all equal. Does that help your question a little bit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's use this example above.
Some of the time. Ready? So we have the rate of consumption for reactant B is 0 0.005 molarity per minute. And I want to know how long would it take to produce 0 0.1 molar of product C? Anyone know how we're going to start this one? Finding moles. We don't need moles here, actually, right? We're just given um, molarity in minutes is our rate. Um, and we're looking for molarity of, right? We're looking, we have concentration that we're looking for. So we're looking for that time component. So we don't need moles here. We can actually just work in molarity directly. But good idea. Who else has an idea? Mm -hmm. We can use the equation above. So we have, which two portions are we going to pick out from here? We're going to pick out B and C. So we can say that the negative change in concentration of B over time with its three in the denominator is equal to the change in concentration of C over its change in time. So what portion are we really looking for in this equation? We're looking for delta T, right? We're looking for how long it takes for that um, concentration of C to go from zero to 0.1. Because we know that the rate of consumption is 0 0.005 molars, um, 0 0.5 molars per minute. So that 0 0.005, what does that equate to in our equation here? Where can we plug that in? Close. Good. It can be delta B over delta T. This whole thing is your rate. So we can say that negative 0 0.005 is equal to your change in concentration of C over your change in time times 4. Right, because so we can solve for that rate of change of delta C first. How do I get delta C over delta T by itself? Mm -hmm. We can multiply this over. So this would be negative three over four <coughs> times. <laughs> Wait a second. Um, I think I should have given to you that the rate of change is a negative value. Um, so we'll just ignore the negative. It'll be asked the correct way, um, but we can ignore the negative for right now. But it will be... All right, we know that the rate of appearance for delta C, we know this has to be positive because we have to produce products, is going to be 0 0.00375 molarity over minutes. Okay, if we can ask ourselves if this makes sense first because we have B is one third and, or we have B is uh, 0 0.005 and that has three Bs that we need in order to produce four Cs. So in order for our rates to be the same, we need to have a slower rate for uh for C in order for those for, to be relative to each other. So this does make sense. Okay, so now we have a rate. So how can we get to minutes? How much time it's going to take? Right, what else do we know? The point one, where does that go into play? That would be delta C, right? We start with zero and we end up with 0 0.1. So we want to know how long that change takes. So we can say that this is 0 0.1. And now this kind of looks very similar to like if you had just a regular molarity question. So now you have right, and you're just looking for delta T and now you can solve for delta T. 
So you can rearrange. So you get delta T. Right, I'm going to put delta T equal to about 26.7. that makes sense how we used our rates in order to find how long something took? Yeah. Yep. So why is it a positive change? Um, so your rate of reaction or your rate of consumption, I think I should have given to you as negative to begin with because you're reducing the concentration for, um, so this should have been the negative. Please zero zero five. Uh, because you're using up your reactants and so your concentration, your T final minus T initial will be negative. Um, but we're looking for the rate for the product. And so the product will always start with a smaller concentration than it ends with. So that should be a positive rate of change. Um, so that's why it needs to be positive there. So we should have just plugged in, you know, negative here, and then it wouldn't have ended up positive. Any other questions? Alrighty, what other questions do we have on rate laws or rates? Yeah. Uh, one question. Uh, delta C is changing this rate of consumption. Delta C is rate of production for C. Because in our original equation, C is a product. So it's the C, the change in concentration for C is the rate of production of that react of that product. Oh. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. What else? Mm -hmm. Do you ever um, analyze any data tables to see the exponents? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. So, let me see. Okay. So we have an example here. So I will we'll keep talking as y'all copy this down. Okay. So in this case here, right, this is your method of initial rates. So you're will be given a table, and this is something that you would collect in lab. Right, this is experimental data that you're using in order to find um, the initial rate of a reaction. And we're going to use these initial rates in our rate law formulas to find what that exponent or what the order is for each of your experiments or for each of your uh, reactants in your rate law. Right, because we know from a general equation, we can't just take the exponents of or take the coefficients of A and B and throw them into our rate law. We have to find this out experimentally or we have to be given those. So 
before we even begin in terms of how we would solve this question, what would be our rate law with exponents as X and Y if we don't know, or M and N, right? If we don't know what the orders for each of these are. How does the rate law always start? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. so we know that rate is equal to K. Mm -hmm. Concentration of A. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, I'll use X and Y here. Right, so we know that our rate laws are determined from our reactants. So our reactants will be in our rate law. We need to know that our rate is equal to K, our rate constant. And this is little k, right? We're going to be talking about big K with equilibrium soon, so don't uh, mess those two up. But little k here, and it's going to be times the concentration of A times whatever uh, order it's going to be, and then B times whatever order it's going to be, right? So that's our general overarching rate law for this equation. If we were to solve this, right, we're looking for the orders of A and B. What are we going to look for in our tables? Where it changes, right? It doesn't necessarily have to double, but it has to change. If we're looking for just A, we want to look for a time where A is changing, but B is staying the same. So is there a case here where A is, cha is changing, but B is staying the same? Between experiment two and three. Yeah, perfect, right? So if we look at two, our concentrations are 0.3 for both A and B. In our experiment three, A now got reduced, but B stayed the same. So in that case, right, A is changing, B is staying the same. That's a good one to look at. If we're looking at three to two, what happens with our concentration as we go from 0.1 to 0 0.3? It changes by how much? Changes by three, right? So this is times three. How much does our rate change by? Also times three, right? And how did we do that? We just took We can plug this into our rate law formula. We can say, okay, I can put my rate of my experiment two over my rate of experiment three, and I can fill in the information that I know based off of uh, the data table below or the data table above. So we know that the concentration of A is 0.3. We know that the concentration of B is 0.3. We don't know what those exponents are, but we have placeholders for them right now. For rate, uh, for experiment three, right, we have now a different rate law, or, or not different rate law, a different rate for that initial uh, reaction. So you can plug that in into our rate law. And we see that these Ks here are going to cancel out because that's a constant that stays the same. And this is the same here as well. The 0.3 to the Y is the same on both the top and the bottom, and that will also divide out. When you have uh, values that are divided under the same exponent, you can combine them. So this actually turns into 9.0 times 10 to the negative 4 over 3.0 times 10 to the negative 4. And you'll have this whole thing of 0.3 over 0.1 to the x power. <laughs> so now it just becomes 3 equal to 3 the x. One question. Yep. Um, how did you, why did you cancel the constants? Like, are they the same value? The K constants? Yes. Yep. So for every reaction you do, so right for this one, for A plus 2B goes to C plus 2D, that will have a rate constant, that it will be the same for everything, every rate that you do, or every experiment that you do, depending on the concentration. So those will stay the same, even with each experiment that you do. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Was there another question? 
Okay. So now that you end up with three equal to three X, you need to ask yourself, what value of X gets me to three? What's the answer in this case? It's just one, All right? So X is equal to one. And we can see that from our initial table where when we triple our concentration of A, we also triple our rate of the reaction. And so when that's the same uh, ratio of tripling to tripling or doubling to doubling, um, we know that that's gonna be what order reaction? First order reaction. And we see that from our math that we get an X equal to one. What about B? What experiments are we looking at for B in order to find the... Yep. Yep, so we wanna look for when A is staying the same, but B is changing. So what experiments are we looking at there? Yeah, I like one and three, right? For one and three, we have A staying the same, but B is changing in those. So as we go from 0.1 to 0.3, what happened to our concentration? It tripled. And as we go from three to three, what happened to our rate? It stayed the same, All right? So there's no change here. If something, if a concentration is changing, but our rate is not changing, what kind of order is that? Zero, right? So overall, our rate law is rate is equal to K, A to the one, B to the zero. So this can be changed and reduced to K times the concentration of A. So our rate is only dependent on our A concentration. Why is it one being a, a being raised to a first power? Um, because we're solving for x and y in these situations. And we saw from our first initial math here that x would be equal to one which means that A is the first order, is first order with respect to A. Oh. Yep, so it's just being raised, right? Let's just calling it the power that it belongs to. Mm -hmm. Right, but we saw that B has a zero order reaction. And so we plug in zero for where the Y value is or where that order would initially be. Do you want to try another one of these? Yeah, no. Any other questions? Yes or no to trying another one? Yeah.
All right. So for this one, I want you to determine the rate law and I want you to solve for the value of K. So you can write a total rate law reaction when you're done. And I'll let you try this on your own. All right, did we get an answer for Q yet? Mm -hmm. yep. So it is a first order reaction for Q.
Okay, so still working, that's okay, but I'll explain Q. So for Q, we're looking at trials one and two, because in this case, Q changes, but X is staying the same. So as we go from 0.12 to 0.24, what happens to our concentration? It doubles. And if we go from 1.5 to 3.0, what happens? It also doubles. So that doubling and doubling is indicative of what order? The first order, perfect. Okay, so we can see that from our math. If we plug that into our rate law, uh, we see that our Ks cancel out. We see that our X values cancel out. And so our exponent of M in this case is what I used is a power of one. So that is first order with respect to Q. Did anyone get what order X is? It is third order, yep. So what did you do in order to get to third order? So I just did, I did K's times Point two, uh, point two of the x, 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 Perfect. Yep. So, and I think this is also important um, to kind of be like a heads up um, problem solver. Uh, in both cases for Q and for X, we put the higher value rates and the higher value concentration on top. Um, this just gives you a whole number rather than a fraction. Um, and that's, I just think, prettier and easier to work with. Um, so in this case, when you look at what cancels out, your Ks again will cancel out and your 0.12 to the Y will cancel out. Um, and we end up with two to the X equal to eight, right? And remember this is two to the X power and not two times X. So if you wanna solve for X, what value do you need in order to get to eight? To eight? Three, right? Because two times two times two is what we're looking at here. So that'll be two times two is four times two is eight. So here X is equal to three. So overall, our rate law becomes K times Q times X to the power of three. What is the overall order for your reaction? It's four, right? And we took that by adding up one from Q and three from X. Yeah. So can basically, it can be like a fourth order reaction, fifth order reaction. It can go five, which it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop that second. Nope. You can actually have half reactions too. Um, but they're, those are not as common. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, um, let's just finish this question real quick. So if we wanted to solve for K, how would we solve for K? Mm -hmm. Yep, you could just plug in, you could take any experiment from before and plug in those values. Right now, you know the exponents for Q and Y, I'm sorry, for Q and X. So you can plug those in and then you're just solving for K because the only unknown would be K here. So you can solve that on your own if you want to, and K is 12.5 liters cubed over moles cubed. Or 12.5 over K cubed. You just plug in the values you found? Mm -hmm. oh. Yep, you can pick any experiment that you want. So you can pick experiment three, say, and you would plug in 1.2 times 10 to the negative two for your rate. You would plug in um, 0.12 for your value of Q, and you would plug in 0.20 for your value of X. 
Yeah. So the weight constant, like the K is going to vary depending on the experiment, right? Um, so your K should be the same for all of the experiments that you solve for. Oh, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, like a different data set. Yes, yep, a different data set would have a different K. Yep. Any other questions? Does this make sense in terms of initial rates and experiments? These are fun, I think. Kind of puzzles. Um, okay, and then you said half-life? Yep. Anything specific about half-life? Yeah. So for most cases for half-life, there is a half-life formula. Um, or yeah, there is a half-life formula for zero with first and second order, but for the most part, it'll probably ask you for like a radioactive decay um, question, and that will always be first order. So right, it'll always be a first order reaction. Does anyone know the integrated rate law for a first order reaction. Um, just what's the regular, you know what the regular one is? Yep. Yep, so this one is ln of um, A at ln of concentration of A at T time T is equal to negative KT plus ln of uh, concentration of your initial concentration. Um, right, so that's your integrated rate law. You can always use your integrated rate law because you can have your initial concentration and you'll have half of that concentration at your half-life and you can plug that in for the concentration of T. Or you can use your half-life formula. And what is the half-life formula? And this is 0 0.693 divided by K, which is just the ln of two, I believe. Yeah, 0 0.693, or the ln of two. <laughs> okay. Um, so a half-life question. So a question would probably look like, Something like this. Right, you might be given a T one half, you might be asked to solve for a T one half, um, but you'll usually see the word decay in a question. So for this one, it's saying how many years will it take um, for 88 grams of tritium to decay from 11 gram sample and you're given the T one half. How would we go about solving this one? Well, is 11, right, if we took 11 
88 divided by 2, we get 44. And then 44 divided by 2, we get 22. And then 22 divided by 2, we get 11. Great. Right, so we could do this by hand, and we could say, okay, over one half-life, we're going to get 44 grams left over. So this is one half-life. This would be your second half-life. And this would be your third half-life. So it's going to take how many half-lives in total to get to 11? going to take three. So we could take three times our T one half, and we would end up with 36.9 years. Okay, we could do it crude like that. But it might not always be that easy. So if we're going to use our rate law for our integrated rate law formulas, what could we solve for first? We could solve for K. We could use our T one half, and we know that 0.693 divided by K will give us our K value. So we could say that 12.3 years is equal to 0.693 divided by K. We can rearrange. We end up with K is equal to 0 0.05631 one over years. And now that we have K, what can we what can we use? Mm -hmm. Then we can use the integrated rate law formula. We know that ln of A at T is equal to negative KT plus ln of A. Our concentrations here are going to be our initial and final uh, gram values. So we're looking for the ln of 11 minus, we just solved for K. Plus the ln of 88. You need your T. And you're solving for that T, right? You're looking for how long, looking for a value there. Right, and if we solve for T by itself, we end up with 36.9 years. And does that match our initial reaction? Yep. So if it's not a perfect, right, divide by two, then you can solve for it this way, where you solve for K first and then plug that into the integrated rate ball. Most of, I think, I would say the 99 times out of 100, they're going to ask you for a first order rate law of decay, radioactive decay. Um, but if they, for some reason, give you a second order um, decay reaction, then your or half life, then your same setup is the same where you would solve for K and then plug it into the integrated rate law. You're just using the second order equations now instead of the first order equations. Can you go up, please? Can I help with half-life a bit? Any other questions on rates and whatnot? Does that help clear up some stuff? Yeah. 
Well, it is 629. Um, so if there's no further, we can stop there, I guess. Um, thanks for sticking around. Thanks for coming this semester. And I guess Monday, I'll, I'm going to talk to Dr. Altman and Dr. Altmos uh, tomorrow and Friday. So I will either have questions that we can go over together or um, you can bring your questions and whatnot, but just keep out from an announcement for me probably Friday about what to expect on Monday. But if you have any specific questions you wanna go over, just let me know by Monday and we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing like L N A T L N A, you're talking about concentration. So like, why can you use gram? Even though that's not a concentration. Um. So because we're talking about concentration in both sections, it doesn't matter what unit is in as long as it's the same unit. Okay. Um, because if you like were to take grams, sulfur, moles, it'd be the same. Ratio. It would be the same ratio as. Okay. If we just use the grams directly, because I thought if it was just like LNAT LNA, fine, but you're also like dividing by the negative K to it. Yeah. Like so, it, because because those values would be changed the same way, right? You have to multiply by molar mass, volume, all that stuff. Those are being changed the same. Any other math after that would stay the same as well. So you can just use those values directly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for all the help. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one quick question. Yeah. So I like, I'm not that good in chemistry. Mm -hmm. And the, I want to go on these exams. Do you have any like recommendations for studying? Um, I would look back at all of your old quizzes and all of your old exams first. I think that would be like the first place that I would start. Um, have you been to the chemistry learning lab at all yet? No. Okay, so in the ILSQ on the second floor, they have the chemistry learning lab and they have packets from all the semester um, with practice problems and whatnot on specific topics. Um, so I would probably go there and they have really good worksheets and extra practice problems that you can do in order to kind of help you learn and go about all of that stuff and review uh, questions for there and kind of practice and seeing questions based okay. off of different topics. So that would be one, I would say all of your quizzes and exams. Two would be the chemistry learning lab. And then three, I would go back through your notes, um, look at any additional practice problems that there might be in the notes. Mm -hmm. um, and then I like chemteam.info is what it's called. And that has a lot of extra practice problems as well. Um, those are very, very helpful. Uh, chem team info. Yep. And how was the, that room that we were talking about before? Uh, it's the ILSQ room W214. So, and I think tomorrow is the last day. Right? Yep, tomorrow, yep, Thursday, and it's open from three to six. Okay. <laughs> Really appreciate it. Oh, anytime. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Um, can I have a quick question? Yep. Um, yeah, I came a little bit late. I have security. Yeah. But uh, when would uh, the part I miss, when would that be uploaded? Um, probably I'm going to go home and once I get the email, I'll probably upload it. So probably like by nine o'clock at the latest. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. I was, I was just wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably, yeah. probably by that. It should be up before I go to bed tonight. So. Yeah, yeah, it at the at the latest it would be like 10 a.m. tomorrow, but it's pretty quick about it. So I just need to eat dinner then upload it. Yep. <laughs> thank you. You too. Thank you. <laughs>